to introduce Professor Tali Tishbi, the, that's it, the head of uh, ICNC, who um, will speak. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mirav. Thank you, everyone. Since uh, I was told only today that uh, I, I'm supposed to give the extra 20 minutes that I was given by mistake by Ruti, uh, I will uh, I apologize for all those changes in schedule, but they actually took 40 minutes out of the previous, uh, they added 40 minutes and take, give, take only 20 from me, so we, we are squeezed because we have another deadline tonight <laughs> that we really have, have to meet around 8.30. So I'm going to, to be a little shorter. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I, I know Shaul uh, essentially only since uh, the early 90s. I actually know Merav since the early 80s. <laughs> so I was her physics lab uh, TA first year. Maybe she remembers it. But uh, I heard about uh, hierarchies, uh, obviously, from uh, Merav and Shaul since the early 90s. As this, I, 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 I guess to this audience, I really don't have to explain those, these pictures. But I still need to, I take them from a Merav uh, review paper, I guess, from uh, 2000 and something, eight maybe. But of course, the, the idea of uh, reverse hierarchy, hierarchies and reverse hierarchies in vision has been around since the mid 90s, I suppose, through the PhD thesis of Merav Hissar. And uh, when I first, the first time I heard it, I thought, okay, this is really a profound and fundamental result. I mean, it really changes everything we understand about uh, perception, and uh, at least to me. But I also had the strong feeling that it needs a theory. <laughs> and, although the name is theory, but what I mean by theory is something that's very similar to what Nava just showed us. I mean, an equation that explains, <laughs> or some first, first principles. And of course, later on, uh, Mirav and Eli and Mon Holme did some interesting work which showed that auditory systems, auditory perception, has essentially the same type of reverse hierarchies. And, uh, but there, it took it immediately back into the domain that I, I felt like knowing something about. Because if these are the same phenomena, essentially, as, as they, these people claim, in, in speech, at least, in auditory perception in general, we believe, or at least I believed, that we understand that this is what they call reverse hierarchy, the fact that we first guess the word somehow and then uh, go backward and verify the different components of the word is actually well known and well understood and we usually call it predictive uh, perception or whatever. I mean, we first guess the word and then verify it. any speech recognition technology uh, is based on this principle. I mean, you, uh, those of you who ever worked with uh, Siri, or I don't know what, what is your favorite re recognizer today, some of them work pretty, pretty well now, they're all based on the same principle. There's a language model which encodes the statistics of words and, and may make a prediction of the next word, which really reduces what we call the perplexity of the, the model to, from all the vocabulary to just very few words, and then we go down using an HMM or anything like this to check that actually the microacoustic structure really fits the world. So it's in some sense in the context of speech or in the context of auditory perception, this reverse hierarchy is clearly related to the fact that we first guess what we, what's coming and then go back and verify it. So this is quite obvious. At this point, it was clear to me that the reverse hierarchy in vision must be related, if these people are right, and these are exactly the same type of phenomena, this must be related to prediction. And uh, it took me some time to actually put it into a, what I call coherent framework, which is close, not quite yet there, but close to what I would like to call a theory in the quantitative sense of having principles, equations, theorems, bounds, something which we can really compare theory with experiments. And, but, but we are getting there. And, uh, but the, simple, the, the, the idea is really very simple. The idea is that, <coughs> is and of course, well, I believe this reverse hierarchy theory is, is, is only a, a very special manifestation of a much more general principle that I 
now call perception action, the information flow in perception and action. And of course, Udi today already did some, uh, some of the work for me, so I'll go through it very quickly. So in principle, we know, I think this is a really a very fundamental drawing that I show all the time, and I'll show it again because there are some people in the audience here that haven't seen it. Essentially, what defines us as organisms, as, as living organisms, is the interaction with the environment. As far as I'm concerned, this is it. Life is defined by the perception, perceptual information that's coming through our senses to us, and by the way we respond to it in this, uh, in this uh, what we now, some, some people call perception action cycle, and as I said already once this week at least, this, this, uh, this is usually, this is a very nice quote from the same Joachim Fuster who, from whom we took this picture. Uh, he called this perception action cycle the circle of flow of information, this is my emphasis, that takes place between the organism and its environment in the course of a sensory guided sequence of behavior towards the goal. Okay, this is a very nice sentence. It's to be fair to Fuster, immediately in, in his, this is in his famous book on the frontal cortex that many of you, I suppose, know, uh, he immediately says afterwards that this information is probably not Shannon's information or something else. Anyway, I, uh, I spent some time, a few years of my life, to actually argue that this information have no, there's no choice, there's only one really good measure of information. But I have to convince you. Uh, but of course, what he called the perception action cycle was really not one cycle. Again, in this thing that was mentioned at least twice today by, by Merab and Udi, our cortex is largely speaking divided between frontal and dorsal, where the frontal part is largely the red part, is, is, is responsible to do, to do executive functions, decision making, planning, what we call high brain functions and intelligence. And the dorsal part is largely responsible for what we call perceptual functions. And of course, if we zoom in a little bit, uh, okay, by, by the way, so eventually what I'm going to argue is that this information flow that is really not in one cycle, but in many cycles, very short cycle that starts from what you call the motor, the sensory motor perception action cycle, which exactly, which is what happened when you actually attach something here, and Newton's third law makes this table pushing me in the same force, and eventually I actually sense the table by acting. So in this very simple Acting, acti sensing is active from the very beginning. But it's not only there. I mean, essentially everything that we do is based on some sort of a cycle like this, from the sensory motor all the way to, to the higher pre-motor functions, and all the way up in this scale, and whenever, whenever we go higher, we have a larger and larger scale. Actually quite interesting, at least I believe that this scale eventually discovered, or a biologist somehow discovered something very fundamental, which we can do these cycles using the same routine, what we call the recursive structure of our thinking. And eventually, I believe at least, that there's a very tight connection between the, the, the structure of these cycles and the, the divergence of, of the, of the, of the uh, cycle length with what we call intelligence, and actually the evolution of the human language. As far as I'm concerned, this is the ultimate theory. <coughs> So, I have, so there's some sort of singularity that we humans went through, where those planning and perception lengths diverged, and we started to think about essentially infinite past and infinite future. But before I get to that, essentially in order to make this type of statement into something like a theory, I want to quantify this flow of information. And of course, I'll, I'll argue this is not a, an assumption. This will come out of quite simple and rigorous mathematics that Everything is bounded by essentially capacity of what we call perception, the perception channel, and the capacity of what I call the predictive channel, or the how, how complex is our interaction with the future of our environment, and how complex is the interaction with, uh, with the past of our environment. And essentially this, this balance, this flow of information will be characterized. I have to make some, some, some distinction between different types of interaction. And, but eventually it will be characterized by very, very simple connections between capacities and rewards and value. And if we zoom a little bit into the brain, of course, I don't have to tell anyone here that, of course, what we call perceptual memory or perceptual functions are, are all our senses. And of course, they go across many timescales related to what we call uh, uh, different types of memory, episodic memory, semantic memory, conceptual memory, and so on. And the same is true about the executive functions. I mean, so we have those 
higher level from the sensory motor all the way to actions, plans, programs, decisions, and so on. So, and of course, you can even dive in and, and start digging in in Area 17 and, and the language uh, broker area and so on that sit in, in, in various places here. I don't want to do it here. I actually want to zoom out and simplify this picture as much as possible in order to get a really simple mathematics. That's what physicists are all go are good at. We essentially, try to have one simple principle, which of course is going to be oversimplified. And the simplified picture that I have is this. So we have an, an, an environment which I can describe by some sort of a stochastic process that have all sorts of alphabetical colors, tones, motions, whatever they are. And eventually, all the brain is doing according to this oversimplistic view is somehow selectively sense the past of our environment in order to eventually make valuable interaction with the future of the environment. So there's a clear time division in time here. This is present, this is past, this is future. And what the brain is doing essentially is compressed in the, in somehow, of course, it's not all done in the cortex. Most of it actually done in the subcortical regions, but eventually select, selectively sense the past in order to make valuable actions and predictions. This is almost as simple, en simple enough and, and naive enough to, to turn it into equation, an equation. And that's essentially what I have been doing for many years now. And I, some people are, are bored of hearing me, but it's getting, it's evolved with time. So essentially, of course, this flow of information is constrained by real things. I mean, it's not only information. I, I never said, I never claim, I, I never argued that only information matters. Of course, what really matters is the kind of interaction which are energy, money, uh, survivability, whatever that means, that we really care about, which we tend to essentially cast into what we call the value of our action. So there's what we call a minimal sufficient statistic about the future, which is the value of all the possible future, which encapsulates so is a sum of all the things that we are going to pay and get as a reward and costs in our behavior. But essentially, and of course there is a cost involved in the, in the, in the, in the perception channel. In the, how, how loud should my, should my sensors be? How much memory should I have? And so on. What should I remember? What I sh can, can forget? And so on. Those are all quite, quite physical, chemical, real estate costs in the brain that uh, I eventually have to pay in order to sense the environment. So, so this flow of information is constrained by both the cost of sensory perception and the value of the action. But this, okay, so it's a one functional that I have to optimize subject to two constraints. This is something which we still <laughs> know how to handle. It's, it reminds me at least things that I've seen in statistical physics uh, many years ago. Of course, there is something very important about this interaction with the environment, which makes it slightly different from statistical physics, and, and that there is some feedback in the interaction. Actually, we know something about the future. We know something about the future, because the environment is not entirely random. Essentially, what I said that everything is based on predictions is, is due to the fact that there's something which we call, the, with Bill Bialik and Ilya Nemenman a long time ago, predictive information. There's something in the laws of physics and chemistry and all that that follows of the world that allow us to make predictions. And actually, I argue that this whole cycle could not work without the ability to predict the future. So unlike what you're usually told that we can't predict the future, it's quite the opposite. Most of the time, we make excellent predictions of the future. Actually, our survivability, our very existence depend on the ability to make predictions. And of course, you have tons of examples. I don't even have to show them or explain it here. But notice that this feedback, we can actually get into what we call directive, directed motion, where we do automatic things, like imagine this, uh, cleaning robots that some of us have at home now. They have sensors, they have actuators, they have memory, they have no learning. But they, they actually play something like a, a perception action loop. They sense the environment, they move, and they clean the house. So the value is how much dirt do you get per uh, watt or no, per unit of battery power and, uh, versus how much you need to sense and how much you need to act. This very primitive exercise, by the way, is already interesting enough to study, okay, so what are the constraints on the sensors of this robot and the actuators of this robot in order for it to make, to make, to be sold eventually? This is the value. <laughs> but uh, it turns out that the equations that I'm going to describe already describe this robot. 
This robot, of course, doesn't do something very important, which is learning. But learning is a second order effect. <laughs> if there's no feedback, there's no learning, but we don't need to learn if we design it to work properly. All right. So, of course, perception in this view, for example, visual perception, this is, a, again, a slide I'm using all the time, but I always say something different about it. So essentially, perception, this is taken from Christoph Koch, from his talk about consciousness, but for me, this is a very similar metaphor. How, ca how does it happen that this gray pixels turn eventually into this conscious percept of a dog or, or a man or view? Of course, Alamar, the classical view of vision, is a bottom-up uh, hierarchy that starts from the very simple pixels and shapes and lines and dots and so on, and corners, and eventually, somehow, miraculously, we get this uh, perception. But we know, and actually, I always say when I show these slides of, of Charles and Merav, I always mention that there was actually an interesting prediction made by John Tostos in 1990 already, uh, uh, which is a computer science theorist, who actually said that Mars picture of vision, the fact that we do everything bottom up, cannot work. It's simply too complex. And he already suggested that some sort of a reverse structure there, although it was not exactly what Charles and Merav said, it was very, very close to that. And it came just from theory. I mean, no experiments, no psychophysics, just calculating complexities. This is actually a nice example how computer scientists can do something useful, but it doesn't happen too often. Anyway, so uh, vision is a lot easier if we don't think about it as a bottom up, but actually as a top down. I first guess there is a dog there, and then I do some hypothesis testing, which for, I guess, most of you know that hypothesis testing is a lot simpler than generative modeling. I only have to check that the nose are there, and the ears are there, and a few other statistical tests about the object, and I immediately discover, with very few, very limited perception, I really don't have to remember almost anything if I want to check the hypothesis that there is a dog in my field. So if this is true, of course, what we see is what we expect to see. And I just give you this very famous example, at least this one is very famous. Uh, if I asked you before, ever seeing this before, what is there? Most of you will have hard time, but if I tell you the domestic, domestic dog or something like this and show you actually the lines, then eventually you'll see it and it will stay there forever. If I ask you what this is, I don't know how many of you know this, but all, all those who have my talks in the past two years know, know this picture. But if you don't know, you have no clue. I mean, you can guess landscape, mountains, rivers, whatever, but if I tell you nude, some of you will see it eventually. <laughs> anyway, this is, this is again, we, we see what we expect to see. So I have to, be, to rush through this talk now, from now on. So essentially the idea is that the basic assumptions I'm making that the brain can solve intractable problems. Okay. This is really the main contribution of computer science to neuroscience. We, computer scientists actually argue or claim, and actually it's not exactly true, that they know how to separate between hard and easy problems. <laughs> actually, we heard from Amir yesterday that it's not always the case, and uh, sometimes what we think of hard is not always hard, and so on. But in general, if I see a problem which is typically hard, not only in some worst case, but typically hard, the brain will not solve it. Why? Because the basic assumption that we all make is that the brain is nothing more than a computer, unless we are all wrong. So, in order for this perception action cycle to work, I must find some tractable algorithms. And where is the, the easiest starting point to discuss this particular, particular picture of stochastic environment with flow of information from the past to the future? So there's a very powerful principle in mathematics, in, 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 in probability theory, which is called the la large deviation theory. And those of you who haven't heard about it, actually heard about it, uh, either through statistical physics or through information theory or through some other, this is, a, a, this is essentially a very simple asymptotic idea. And I'm going to apply it directly without making any other assumptions to this model of interaction with the environment. And again, I'm, I'm sorry for being a little bit technical. So usually what we do when we talk about environments, we invented this, uh, these models that, uh, again, computer scientists or, or, or control theorists invented a long time ago, which is now known as Markov decision processes and partially observed Markov decision processes, which essentially just assume that the world is made out of finite number of states and some actions and observations emitted from each state at each time. And my goal in life is to, to act in such a way that will maximize my expected future reward. And the rewards are associated with every transition in this graph. Those of you who didn't get it, it's not important. 
What is important that I can turn this, so essentially you all know this, anybody who learned about reinforcement learning, for example, essentially what this model is saying is that our interaction with the environment and just replace agent with an organism is we act and then the environment change to another state and while changing to another state, it, it may emit, give us such some reward. This picture is taken directly from Sutton and Barto in the, the famous book on reinforcement learning. And essentially, this is more or less the accepted model of interaction with the environment anywhere now. Of course, the, the only thing that we add to it is that we don't really see the state of the world, but we see some noisy version of it. We have some noisy observations, which makes the problem from easy to hard computationally, very hard, actually, untractable in some sense. And what we usually do, I just want to mention it is very, again, very briefly, in order to solve this equation, a guy, clever guy called Bellman, showed us that, it's, that this value, which is the expected future rewards from here on to infinity, can in some sense be calculated very simply using some sort of a simple recursion. The value at my current state is simply the average over my current next state plus the reward I get in between. And this famous equation is known as the Bellman equation. What is really important about it is that it turns it, this hard problem of planning the future into a tractable problem that we can all, uh, into something which we can do. Essentially what I, what I want to do first, and this turned out to be a big, a big venture on its own, and a lot of people have been trying to do this, is to show you, or to marry, in some sense, the work of Richard Bellman about optimality and the work of Claude Shannon about communication. And actually I argue that these two are two facets of one theory to some extent, in, in, some, in some aspects of it. And essentially, one, while we do, once we do this, we essentially combine these two seemingly different questions. I mean, how do we plan efficiently in order to achieve reward? And how do we communicate efficiently in order to transfer information from side to side? Seemingly different, seemingly different mathematics, but have something very similar in common, which is, again, this asymptotic theory of large deviation. So I just, again, for, for those of you who follow me, uh, uh, what, what we do in large deviation, essentially we look at all possible distributions, over which are now denoted by, here denoted by some sort of a simplex or a triangle. If you don't follow me, forget it, it will not be very important. And I constrain, I start with some initial distribution which can be completely random or completely stupid. And then I ask, what is the probability that this stupid behavior will actually give me a certain value, which is not stupid. I mean, what is the probability that a drunk who is doing completely random motions will actually get to the moon. Okay, probably very low. <laughs> if you think about it, this is the probability, this is really the basic question of evolution. I, mean, I start from some random behavior and somehow miraculously I progress and evolve. And what large deviation is telling us that if I put a value constraint on this distribution, so I look at only the distributions that have a certain value, so this is some sort of a linear expectation constraint on the probabilities, then only a small region of this simplex is really allowed then uh, there is some simple mathematics to tell us that if I look at large enough number of interactions or large enough sample, in, in our case it's large enough cycles of interaction with the environment, then with very high probability my, pro my, my state is going to be here at one very specific point. It's going to be sharp on this point completely and nothing else is going to be likely to happen exponentially small in, in this cycle, number of cycles, this uh, n here, and essentially the probability that I will have some value and still survive and still uh, come from this random distribution is dominated by one point which can be easily calculated. Minimize some function of the distributions. Uh, those, this function actually appeared yesterday in the, in the, in the party, but uh, those of you who didn't get it, uh, this is called the cross entropy or the KL divergence between distribution. I don't want to describe it now. It's a very simple logarithmic, uh, logarithmic ratio average. The log of the st a sequence over P o versus Q, average with respect to P. And I, so I, I average only with respect to P's that have at least the value that I want. And this is going to be with most likely state of my organism. Now this very simple and very general mathematics, I now plug on a model of the environment. And here I want to be a little more cognitive because after all we're talking to a much more general audience. So, so I, 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 I actually write this uh, environment interaction by a graphical model. This is essentially, this is supposed to represent the state of the world. This is supposed to represent the state of my mind. The observation that if states what I see about the world, the actions of each state is what I act when I act back. 
And essentially, the, once I, I, I draw this graph, I actually assume some sort of probability structure on the, on the, on the combination of me and the environment. And usually, the, the interesting questions are, what should I observe? What's going on on this channel? And what should I act? What is my policy of actions? And of course, every cycle like this, when I observe and act, the world is going to move to a new state, and I'm going to get some sort of reward or cost. Actually, there's something interesting which not, most people don't see. When I, when I move through action and observation, again, I do this action perception cycle, something in my memory, in my mind is going to change. This is my mental change. And this is also going to be uh, accompanied by some sort of reward, which, we're going, which, which you can explicitly calculate from this general principle. So forget about the mathematics here at this, side, at this point, unless you can read it. So essentially what I do, I, I look at this log probability ratio, but really what I'm thinking about is some sort of a game. I move, the world move, I move, the world move, and I want to constrain this game according to the accumulated value that I achieve during this interaction. Again, this is the most complicated slide. I don't want to, again, for those of you who, who can read it, all you, all you see is that I just write this cross entropy in a recursive way. I mean, I look at the log likelihood of these probabilities, and eventually I have an explicit, just from large deviation, there's nothing else here, I have an explicit expression for these two terms that are associated with the transition in the world and the transition in my mind due to action and perception. And if you notice the colors, these are the blue and red colors of Fuster. One of them is associated with sensory information. How much the world changed due to my action compared to some random motion. And the other one is associated with my action with the red part. How much the world, how much the world affects my action compared to some random motion. <coughs> now, those of you who, who are not afraid of log ratio probabilities, you know that if I average those things, I actually get something very nice. I, 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 I see immediately that both of these terms have some, some very natural interpretation as capacities. So I'll come back to this. So essentially, I did nothing. All I did is writing the environment in some sort of probabilistic model, and then took the large deviation limit and looked for the most typical behavior of such an environment. And what you get immediately is some sort of an interesting dual picture. There is the real world, which is described by the Bellman equation uh, originally, the accumulated of reward. But there is an internal world, which is described by the same type of interaction with the environment. But the, uh, my actions and sensors actually accumulate something else, which is these two terms which I call now the information game, these delta i's. So every interaction of me with the environment is involved both in reward, which is some, can be energy or something else, money that is involved in the external world, and a change in my mental state, which is accumulated by gain of information. OK, so uh, we first, just from this very simple observation and, and some, some simple mathematics, I get a very nice equation which looks to me something like the first law of thermodynamics. It's very has exactly the same structure. My gain in reward multiplied by some Lagrange multiplier uh, is essentially associated with the sum of two capacities. How much information I obtain from the environment due to my action, my previous action, and how much information I need to know in order to act next. And just by averaging these two things, I get that gain in reward is directly related up to some constant which has the role of an inverse temperature here to the sum of these two capacities. So this is the answer to the first question, what is really the optimal flow of information between me and the environment? Notice here that I assume stationarity. I assume that it can average for a long time, and therefore I'm really calculating the behavior of this robot. Nothing more than that. There's no, let, no, no learning yet. This is what I call metabolic information processing. But even this already is giving us, and this is the work of Jonathan Rubin, who's supposed to be here somewhere, even this is already giving us something interesting. I actually get the connection between value and, and information. How much value in my behavior actually have to get what is the most, the, the maximum value that I can get at the given information about the future? And what you see here is a very simple uh, toy example. There is this simple S-like maze that I, and I, I, my, my, my organism needs to get from here to here. And essentially, in order to do it perfectly, it needs essentially 70 bits of information. It's not important. This is the number of steps that you need to, decisions that you have to need to make, make along the way in order to make it optimally. But what happens now if I reduce the information about the future? I don't know 70 bits about the future, I know less. 
So you see something quite remarkable and quite general, that you can reduce it from 70 to 20, essentially, without losing much value. The values change only very little. So in some sense, there's absolutely no sense to actually predict the future in that long, long, uh, in that, that detail. I can, I can, what you see here essentially is, is I move from a t completely deterministic optimal behavior, so I only all, all those red colors means that I do precisely what I should do to a completely random behavior, and you see that somewhere in between, let's say here or here, I, I, I actually, with this temperature going to be higher and higher, I actually do something which is very close to the optimal with a lot less information about the future. Okay, not only that, those there are spe specific areas in this curve that tell me precisely where should I really care about my actions. And these are un not surprisingly exactly the corners here. So let me show you another nice example that, that Jonathan uh, prepared for us. Uh, I can actually take in an, a more extreme situation. Imagine that you have to move through a minefield so you really don't want to stop to step on any one of those stars. And of course, in order to do the optimal trajectory, this one, you really need to know exactly every mine where it is. But of course, if I reduce the number of information, uh, according to this algorithm, you're going to jump immediately to a much, much better place, which is simply going around. Mm -hmm. And going around means I don't want to assume that I know where the mines. Most of you will not want to assume that, and they uh, will prefer to do what we naturally do. So this is really uh, an example of how information can help you. If you think you know and you don't know, you're going to be killed. Okay. So now I'm going to move to the second part, which is easily em 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 the, the emergence of hierarchies. So how much information is in the past about the future in general? It seems like a too general question to answer. But turns out with Bill Bialik and Elian Emmerman again, back in 2001, we, we, we actually looked at stochastic stationary processes like Markov chains or anything like this which you can assume as a reasonable model of an environment which is stochastic enough and just calculated this information. And of course any physicist should see immediately that if I open let's say a window into the past, uh, my drawing is a little primitive, I just uh, mirrored it but never mind that, it shouldn't be like this, but uh, uh, and another window into the future and I ask what, ask what is the mutual information between these two, you know that for stationary processes when I go walk long enough, what I'm going to see is that the information is simply the entropy of, the, of both of them, the, the, the sum of the two entropies minus the entropy of the union. Those of you who didn't follow, never mind. So, uh, so and, and we know, of course, that uh, en entropy is extensive, so this simply sum up to eventually, asymptotically, to zero, the difference between them. But this is not quite true. As we all know, again, from physics and from other places, there are sub-extensive terms. There are things that depend on the boundary. And these are precise to the, the mutual information between past and future is a sub-extensive quantity. What it means, in, in, essentially, mutual information is simply this, uh, the average log of the probability of the future given the past divided by the actual probability of future. And I can calculate it in many, many cases, uh, analytically. And what we can show, not too difficultly, that any finite dimensional process, something like a Markov chain, or anything like this, or, or a Markov decision process, never mind, will have th this predictive information where, where this window is long enough, behaves like a log, multiplied by the dimension of the model over two. Those of you who, who are familiar with minimum description lengths or, or something like this, uh, know this, this is precisely what we call the intrinsic structural complexity of the sequence. Notice that it grows like log, it's a lot lower than t, okay? And of course, what we also know that uh, if the, if the model is actually not finite dimensional, something like our language or, or, or things which have more and more parameters, we can also show, we showed in this work with, with Bialik and Nemerman that this is, it must go like a power law and, and the power is less than one, like a square root or something like this. And of course this parameter here, this power, is a function of the complexity of the environment, nothing else. Okay, so that's very nice, because now I, I cast, I plug this result, mathematical result, if you want, into, into my understanding of perception and action, and I get that in order to make plans, I, I can really calculate how much information I really need to know about the future in order to act valuably. And of course, as I just told you, it usually goes like a sublinear function, this is a log in this case, which means, then this is really the most important slide in my talk, I prepared it especially for this meeting to make everything clear. So. Uh, my assumption is that my plans in the future are, are going to be in equal complexity, which means I'm not going to invest 
more information about next month than I actually have about next month. So if I make the first step, I know quite a lot about the next step, but you ask you where I'm going to be in five minutes or where I'm going to be in five hours, I know of course a lot less, you all know that. So our information about the future is reducing, but it's not diminishing, it's just going slowly. The derivative of this curve, which is one over, one over t in this case, is giving us uh, how much I really know about the faraway future in the logarithmic environment like this. So imagine that you actually want to do optimal planning. What you need to do is to work with equal units of complexity. I don't want to assume more, you know, and believe me here, that in order to make this Bellman recursion tractable, I need to do this. Because if I don't do this, my number of states is going to explode on me. So essentially what I do, I work with units of information, equal units of information, and I see how much, how time behaves. Of course, this is trivial. If I take equal units of information, time will grow on a logarithmic curve exponentially. <laughs> okay, so this is log, equal units of information about the future, gives me exponentially long units of time. This is all I need to know. Now, I, there's simply not enough, not more information in my, this is a, a mathematical result. I cannot know more about a stochastic environment than this curve, which means that if I want to work in equal units of complexity, I must treat time non-uniformly, non-linearly. So my perception of time, this cognitive perception of time, must grow when I think further and further into the future. And the same is true about the past. It's completely symmetric. So if I want to actually write a Bellman-like equation on this world, this is the state that I have to think in the, on the, on the, in the next time step, and this is the state in the, in the, in the time t plus 2 and so on, you see that the time that emerged during those steps on which I have the same amount of information grow exponentially, which means that in order to make this tractable, I, ne I need to do what Merab once called, and I like this world, I, did, I need to do chunking of, this, of the world. I need actually to cast this such so that the magnitude, the number of states here, and the number of states here, and the number of states here, will be the same number, more or less. If I can do this, then I can have tractable planning. So this is it. In order to do this, I have to do something which physicists usually call renormalization. It's very similar to the renormalization group in, in statistical physics. Essentially what I do is look at the nearest, nearest states as some simple structure, and this is a group of the next states which are exponentially longer. And this is a group, as I said, which is again exponentially reduced and so on. So there's some sort of similarity mapping that works in time, which is simplifying the world for me from time to time. Now this is the whole idea, and actually took us, me and some colleagues, uh, Daniel Polani and, and Stefano Suato and a few others, to think about it a little more. And of course my students, uh, uh, ma ma mainly Roy, Roy Fox and a little bit Nori and a few others today, were thinking with me about it, how to actually make this into a real equation. And uh, it turns out that the whole thing is, struct is, is doable under some very simple and very general assumptions. You can really write a, a Bellman-like equations where the states of the world are not the same states, but are chunk states. Now, okay, this is really nice because it immediately gives us the, the reverse hierarchy. Uh, uh, essentially, it tells us, look, this picture that I had before about the world is wrong. You have to think about larger and larger steps when you go further and further into the future. And indeed, uh, uh, so, so I have essentially this uh, funny description of time. There's the external time that tells me how the world is moving, and this is my perception of time, which I call the interesting, intrinsic or information time, which is thinking about the future and the past in terms of equal units of complexity, equal unit of information that I actually have about the future. So again, simple enough to actually cast into mathematics, and, uh, and it gives us actually quite something. First, first of all, there is an algorithm. Actually, it's known in information theory as successive refinement which is done in ray distortion theory all the time. Essentially, this is what happens in your JPEG movies when you improve the capacity and suddenly things appear more and more sharply. You get more and more resolution. This is some sort of give, give me more bits and I give you more details in, a, in an optimal way all the way. So there are guarantees that under some very general conditions we can do this. We just have to copy it or, or, or apply it into this picture. And some of it has been done already, not all. And then, but, but there are immediately some interesting predictions from this very simple picture. The first one is what you call reverse hierarchy theory. Essentially, you know that planning is done from the top backward. I mean, this is essentially the key function of control. The Bellman equation, I need to know where I go, and then I track back my action. This is the way your, 
GPS planners are designed. This is the way we always plan. We start from the end and go back. But if I have different resolutions about different times, I start from a very coarse end and then refine it recursively using this uh, successive refinement algorithm. So reverse hierarchy theory is an immediate consequence of the fact that I have to plan into the future and I know less about the future. But there's also this specific way of chunking the states into larger and larger pieces. And, and, and again, I, I can explain more, but I don't have time for that. This is something which is immediately came to me when I saw Mirav's title today. I thought that he was going to say something about this. There's a duality between perception and planning simply because of the symmetry of the prediction information with respect to past and future. So I know that something very similar has to happen about my mem with my memories and with my planning actions. This duality is, again, a mathematical consequence. They're not, they don't, they're not necessarily the same structure because we may have different costs in perception and different values in actions. But they are related up to these constants in stationary environments. And, and actually, something which I really was m my aha <coughs> moment in this story is that you get the discounting. You know that in, in, in reinforcement learning, people, people uh, discount the future because otherwise all things diverge. So usually what they do, they do exponential discounting, which means that they multiply by a number less than one each time. But I never liked it. Why and when you should do this exponential discounting? So what we get here is that you get exponential discounting for free as a prediction of the theory in those finite dimensional environments. But you get something else, which is also measured cognitively, which is called hyperbolic discounting, something like a power law, not, not exponential, in, in, in environments which have a, a power law predictive information. OK, so I, I'll stop here. Essentially, there, there, there are many other things which I just hint to you. And essentially, my aim is really to take it all the way to understanding of the structure of human language, which to me only reflects this predictability of words, the fact that words behave that way tell us something very deep about the way new words and new concepts are emerging in our memory. So everything is related. And I, I like to finish with this picture. Essentially, what, what I'm telling you is that our cognitive perception of time is like a fisheye. And it's fisheye not only in space, but also in time. See, this is evening, this is morning. And we, we have higher resolution in, lo in short times and much longer resolution, uh, poor resolution in a lot of time. And what is really crucial for this to work is that we have a recursive statement that can take this high resolution into final resolution, a low resolution into high final resolution in the same way as all steps. And this is the, the reason why we eventually can think. And I, I believe that this is uh, also behind the reverse hierarchy. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. There's a complex environment, but it repeats itself in time. This is, by the way, exactly what neuroscientists do all the time in their labs. I mean, uh, they, 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 they fit some sort of a stationary environment to the apparatus. The environment is under their control. This is what Ellie is doing in his auditory perception experiments and so on. This, otherwise, you can't average and you can't say anything. But, but still, even in a stationary environment, you may have entirely different structure of perception versus action, but both of them scale in the same way, according to this theory at least. This is a prediction, if you want. Yes? Um, maybe it's more like a comment. In, in psychology, they have a, there is a concept called psychological distance, and there is these really neat experiments where, just depending on whether you tell people that this thing happened uh, you know, the next town or across the ocean, their ability later to answer questions, to recall, etc., cetera, uh, is, is, can be drastically different. And um, similarly, so you can do it both in space and in time. So just by telling people, uh, manipulating what they think is the distance, okay, their uh, perception and recall and all sorts of things can change. And um, I always thought that intuitively it's not really that surprising, and yet it's in some senses really mind blowing. But I didn't have, and it seems to me that basically your thing would predict. Yeah, there are, there are many things that I omitted here. One of, my, one of them is I promised if I had to talk about Elsper paradox and other things, but <laughs> I simply didn't have time for that. So there are many issues that seem to be isolated and, and, and surprising in psychophysics and psychology that I believe in the right formulation, it's not always that simple, can be, can be brought into this desk of, of very simple assumptions. At least, as, as you know, as a straw man, <laughs> try to see what happens. So Elsper paradox is one of those things that those of you who attended the first talk yesterday should know what it is. There is this effect that of, of the 
fact that we actually tend to be to have ambigu ambiguity aversion, which is some surprising and is different from risk aversion. And it's also directly related if you look at those information gains. Uh, it turns out that you can explain as a paradox. I'm not sure I buy it completely, but this is one possible application of such uh, simple theories. Yeah. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question. I'm just saying that there are many other things to do and uh, just starting. Most of what I said so far is already half done <laughs> or less. <laughs> All right, so I think I'm more or less on time. Let's stop here. So I think uh, now it's fun time, right? And which means that there's reception and one floor above to which everybody's invited. And then there's music and. Where is the music? Where? Yeah. Well, it's all here. After the, rece the reception is like an hour, and then. Fun continues here.